Welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Rafael P. Roman. You know, as we approach the one-year anniversary of our life in lockdown, we can't help but think back to the beginning. Last spring, the tri-state area was ground zero for the coronavirus in this country, with New York and New Jersey fighting to secure testing, PPE, and ventilators. Nearly a year later, the two states are once again in crisis mode and racing to administer the vaccine amid reports of dwindling supplies. So where are New York and New Jersey failing and succeeding in distributing the vaccine? How are Governors Cuomo and Murphy doing during this stage of the pandemic? And how much blame does the federal government deserve for the problematic rollout so far? Joining us now with answers to these and other questions as part of our Eye on the Vaccine coverage is Steve Adubato, Metro Focus contributor, the host of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato and the author of the forthcoming book, Lessons in Leadership, Innovation, and Disruption in an Age of COVID-19 and Beyond. How does he do it? How does he do it? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Steve. I, I, I better start writing real quick. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll put you back here as soon as you get the thing done. Nobody reads more than Raf, let me tell you that. <laughs> Good to see you, my friend. Nice to see you, my brother. Happy New Year, by the way. I don't think I've said that so far. Same to you. Uh, so listen, you know, there's a general... Uh, if sometimes grudging agreement that the Trump administration did something special when they created this vaccine in less than a year. But as someone said, a vaccine doesn't cure the virus, doesn't eliminate the virus. Vaccinating people does that. And there's been a problem in the logistics of doing that from the very beginning at the federal level. I wonder if you could tell us why, why that was. First of all, Raf, um, always good to be with you. But and I wish we could talk about something more positive. I'm sure we will. But I got to tell you, at the same time, while we congratulate those involved in the Operation Warp Speed operation, if you will, I got to tell you, I don't know if there was any, as a student of leadership, logistics is a big part of it. And I don't know the, the degree to which the Trump administration and those responsible who actually predicted, Raf, and you know better than anyone, 20 million vaccines by January 1, and we went yeah. 3.4, 3.5 at that time. Logistics aren't sexy. Logistics aren't fun. You often don't get credit for it, but the reality is leadership, without getting into the weeds, without understanding what the logistical challenges, obstacles were and are, and dealing with them as the vaccine was being developed by Moderna and Pfizer and soon to be Johnson & Johnson, it's a failure of leadership. It's not even about blaming. It's about asking the question, what were you doing? And yeah. then, real quick, Raph, the 2020 election, the partisan, often hateful politics around it, and then the aftermath after the election, leading up to January 6th, what does that have to do with the vaccine distribution? A huge distraction because an awful lot of people in the federal government yeah. And across the country, we're focused on that as opposed to distribution of the vaccine, which has always been the priority. Yeah, let's, let's, do, let, let, let's, let's stay on that, you know, because some people are saying uh, the criticism that some people are making is that the Trump administration made the same mistake in rolling out the vaccine that they did at the beginning with the test, the PPE, uh, the ventilators, in that they thought their job was done once they got it to the states and then, OK, states, you figure it out. Um, and that that was the underlying philosophy that was repeated this time around. Do you think there's something to that? You know, uh, as a student of leadership, writing, teaching, and making mistakes all the time as a leader, you go back to Harry Truman. You know, again, Raph, what that said on his desk, a little placard, yeah. the buck stops here. It seems to me that the philosophy, that the approach was the buck stops anywhere else other than with us, me, as the leader of the free world, as a president, um, whether it's President Trump or anyone else, and the federal administration. They said, look, we're going to dump it to the states, as you well said. The problem is the states are saying, OK, well, how do we plan? How do we engage in logistics? How do we plan to distribute this? How do we set up our sites if we don't know the number of vials we're going to have, the number of vaccines we're going to? It's impossible. So yes, the states are involved. And I'm in Essex County, New Jersey, with, frankly, a first class operation and distributing the vaccines they have, about 1,500 a day. But the county executive, Joe DiVincenzo, told me recently in an interview, we could do five, six, seven thousand 7,000 a day logistically if we had it. States so, so and Steve, local for, for time's sake, let me, let me just ask you, 
I wonder how you would uh, grade in leadership quality the governors of the respective states, New York and New Jersey, Cuomo and Murphy, and the way that they've rolled out the vaccination within their, their sphere of responsibility. And give them a week. What have they done well and what have they done badly? Okay, first of all, I'm going to argue that Governor Murphy, his heart's in the right place. They have these mega sites set up. As we're speaking now, some of them actually got shut down. I'm praying that by the time this airs, they're back up. That being said. Shut down because they didn't have vaccines. Thank you, Raf. Yeah. I got to tell you something. I don't know why they didn't know. I don't know why these questions weren't being asked. I don't know why they didn't press the issue before the end of the year, be right after the election. They needed to clarify that. And if the federal government wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing, the states needed to say it. And I'm going to argue now that Governor Murphy is arguing that his relationship with the president, President Biden, um, should change that. That's not going to by itself change the number of vaccines available. Governor, available. Governor Cuomo is arguing the same thing. Yeah. They have similar approaches, Raf, but you can't yeah. grade or judge a vaccine distribution plan if they're saying we don't have it to distribute in the first place. Do you think that both of these guys are depending too much on the new, uh, the new sheriff in town in Washington, D.C., and the Congress in the hands of Democrats to, to smooth out the problems, hmm. these problems and other problems, really? Yeah. So, yes, but you can understand it. At the same time, here's my fear, Raf that taking your question in a different direction, well, shouldn't the states be trying to figure out how to cut their own deals, how to get vaccine supply on their own? Well, that's a very entrepreneurial way of looking at it. Here's the problem. If states start to compete with each other and you've got price wars going on, the states with more resources than others, you have a greater disproportionate distribution of health care in the state, excuse me, in this nation than we already have based on economics, based on who's black and brown, who's in certain communities. That's my fear. But I know Murphy and Cuomo are tempted to try to cut their own deals. But I would argue if it's not done by the federal government first to get the supply, it's not going to work. That's the only way this will work, Raf. You know, you were talking about passing the buck before. You know, the criticism, that we talked about this before um, on Governor Cuomo, and maybe it's the same with Murphy, you can tell me, is that when things get rough, they start pointing, he starts pointing the finger. <laughs> first it was de Blasio, then it was Trump. Uh, do you think that's a fair argument? And is that happening in New Jersey as well? It's a great question, Raf. And I want to tell you, I actually have been critical. And we have an interview coming up with the governor. And I hope because of this, he, they don't cancel. But <laughs> I've been critical of, of both governors. And here's why. And on the issue that you and Metro Focus have focused on so many times, I'm going to argue that the nursing home debacle early on of sending people with COVID back into nursing homes without making sure they were going to be separated, quarantined from everyone else. When I asked the governor about that, Governor Murphy, and I know Governor Cuomo said the same thing, nursing homes didn't do what they were supposed to. No, no, you don't send them back. And I know it's easy for me to say this. I'm not the governor, but you don't send them back without knowing what the conditions will be before you make that decision. It's passing the buck in my view. Yeah. So listen, besides the timely distribution of the vaccines, uh, another problem, which if, if, my, if my mind is, is, if I remember correctly, was the number one preoccupation before the supply problem is that uh, a lot of people don't want to take the vaccine. Um, how are the leaders in the two states, as far as you know, how are they dealing with that, getting the information out to let people know that they, they don't have to worry about it and they should take it? You know, Raf. We're actually on our series um, on State of Affairs. We're doing some programming similar to Metro Focus, except more New Jersey centric about vaccine awareness. Most common questions being asked, um, most candid answers. And, and fr uh, frankly, Raph, sometimes the answer is we don't know. We don't know what the impact is long term. We don't know what the impact is going to be on a woman who wants to become pregnant. We don't know exactly because they weren't in the trials. But I'll say this. I believe Governors Murphy and Cuomo are doing the right thing by being very public, by getting the vaccine themselves, by having other public people, by people of color who are recognized in their respective communities, respected in their respective communities out there. That's all important. But I got to tell you, anecdotally, when you hear people still talking about frontline healthcare workers being reluctant, yeah. that sends, I don't care how much public awareness, public education, promotion you do, that scares the heck out of people. And I'm saying in the hospitals and our healthcare system, if 60, 70, 80%, really my opinion, 80% don't do it, 
It's going to be very hard to convince more people to take that vaccine if those who are supposed to know best are resistant. Yeah, yeah. We got about, what, 50 seconds left. Um, we're approaching the first year anniversary of the lockdowns in our area. When do you, where do you think we will be when March comes around in New York and New Jersey? Hey, Raph, you know, I can only pray and hope that we, we have two teenage boys and we have a little girl who's 10. And I'm going to tell you something. We just, I'm speaking for our family and frankly, every other parent out there who's got kids at home and we can't do it. I got to tell you, Raph, the balancing act between public safety and the economic growth and our own mental and emotional health, yeah. I am not, it's above my pay grade to predict that, how it plays out but I will pray and hope that things will get better very quickly for all of us. All right, Steve, we end with that. Thanks so much, my brother.